four minutes and we'll be starting service today. You got two minutes. Or we could go ahead and get started and Pastor Matthew would just be on two minutes earlier. How's everybody's week going? Good. Good? Awesome. I'm just... Well, one day, back in the old days, when it snowed in 1993, we had to walk uphill both ways in the snow to school and home. I remember the snow of 93. How many of y'all remember the snow of 93? I really wished we would have had another one this year. How about y'all? No. It was horrible. So we need to pray that this coming winter is massive. Lots of snow. Yes. Lots of... Uh, what would you pray for? What does be buried? Tell stuff you can Hey, any of y'all ever had chickens? Yeah. How many of y'all know if you have chickens, there's other animals that may appear? Yeah. Like rats. Yeah. I don't wish a plague of rats on anybody. <laughs> now they're starting to get thinned out. They've been eating a lot of poison this week, so hopefully they'll die soon. <laughs> Do what? Explosion? Wow, that would be fun. And that wouldn't be harmful to my chickens. Learn something new today. All right, guys, it is now 1030. <laughs> How many of y'all glad to be at church this morning? Amen. I'm the oddball that's starting service this week, so I guess we'll do it in the order I do it in. How many of y'all like giving? How many of y'all have seen blessings from giving? I know that we don't give because we are, we're looking for something. We give because it's our heart towards God to give back to Him what He's already given us. So there's two different ways you can give. You can give in the baskets that are in the back of the church or you can give online. Just want to encourage y'all to give. Be consistent in your giving and I promise you God's going to move. I have a few quick announcements I'm going to run through and then I'm going to pray and we'll go ahead and have church today. How many of y'all ready? Ready to worship God. Tonight at the park in Damascus, anybody know what's going on? Fire by night. Going to be a night of testimony and worship. Want to encourage y'all to come on out. Six o'clock, things get started. About 6.15, 6.30, we'll go ahead and have food. Seven o'clock, worship will start. And it'll be a great night together. Want to encourage y'all to come on out. I uh, want to continue to encourage y'all to give to uh, the Haven Arrest in Bristol. There's a couple of lists floating around. I know people have already signed up. Uh, they need items. The list are in the back of the church on the clipboard. Um, Camp dates and information are up on the church app. So if you have kids going to camp, please check out the app. Uh, May the 21st will be our, uh, when we honor our 2023 grads on the sign now. Wow. It's up there when I'm talking. Awesome. Uh, and just want to, we want to recognize the graduates and what they've accomplished. Last but not least, we're getting a security team together again. If you're interested in being part of the church security team, please see Elaine. Sonia, wake up. <laughs> Worship team, y'all can come on up. Lord, I just thank you for today. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we can rejoice in you. Lord, knowing that your joy is our strength. Lord, we thank you. We give you all the glory and the honor. Lord, we just come to worship. And we know when we worship and praise you, things change. Lord, we just honor you today. Amen. Amen.
Well, good morning. And yes, morning. I'm sleepy. I've gone three times since I sat down on that chair. <laughs> Has everybody had a good week? Yes. Good, good. Well, love y'all. We're going to go and start worshiping the Lord and praising Him and giving Him honor and glory with our praise.
It's actually scripture. <laughs> Gets it in your head and you continue to sing it all through the week. Thank you, Jesus.
Sunday, but it's always a wonderful Sunday in the Lord's house. It's a great time to be able to just come and worship Him, be in His presence. He's here right now. want to go ahead and uh, again I want to thank everybody for coming out and, uh, just uh, you know hope that you use this time to, to really connect with God you know that's what all this time of worship is really about um, you know it's it's great to have the music and hear the music but you know this is our time to start connecting to God and we do that through worship uh, and that's why it's so important um, and so I'll go ahead and uh, I'll pray over the prayer requests and then uh, we'll go into our time of communion. So if you guys want to go ahead and start passing out the elements, we can. But we'll go ahead and pray over the prayer requests. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Father, for the simple fact that you're willing to meet us where we're at. And Father God, we just pray that your hand will be upon these prayer requests through at the foot of this cross. We just pray that, Lord God, you would touch each and every one of them, Lord, in your own special and perfect way. And Father, help us, Lord, to be able to understand, Father, whatever your answer is, Father, even if it's not the answer that we want. Father, your answer is the perfect answer. So help us, Lord, to be understanding of that. Help us to have the strength, Father. And Lord, with uh, some things that uh, didn't quite get answered as we had hoped, Father, just pray that, Lord, you just uh, be with those that have lost loved ones. Father, give them strength. Help them, Lord, to trust in you fully. And Lord, we just pray that you just go with us now, Father, for it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is, what this communion thing is, is I'm going to talk a little bit about taking communion the right way. Because a lot of times we get bogged down in religion when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Um, and what I'm going to be reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And in this section of scripture, they were having an issue with how the Lord's Supper was being performed even back then. You know, they were doing it the wrong way. They were, you know, going about it and basically treating it like it was a meal instead of using it as a moment to remember Jesus Christ and what he did. And so a lot of times that's kind of what we even get bogged down in sometimes is is instead of taking the lord's supper for what it is as a remembrance of what it was that jesus did for us we'll take it in a different manner thinking that we have to do it a certain way we have to do it at a certain time you know there are people that have thoughts that you know by doing this it magically transforms into something else you know there's all kinds of ideas that go along with the lord's supper when in reality what jesus said was was do this in remembrance of me to remember what it was that he did and it was every time you do this do it in remembrance of me so a lot of the religion that goes around this kind of gets shut out <laughs> if we really look at the scripture and see what it is that God said you know it isn't something where we can only take it at church 
because God said every time you do this not every time you get together in church not every time you fellowship together he said every time you do this do it in remembrance of me that means if you want to have communion at your house you can have communion at your house you know if you want to you know I probably wouldn't suggest it because prayer and everything but you know if you want to take communion driving in your car you can take communion driving in your car you know it isn't a thing of where you're doing it it's a thing of how you're doing it and as long as you're doing it in remembrance of God that's what the important thing is remembering that it was his broken body you know that's what the symbol of the bread is and again that's a symbol it doesn't magically transform it doesn't you know in and itself doesn't do some miraculous thing but remembering what Jesus did recognizing him having that connection to Jesus that's what does the miraculous things this is just juice and bread that's all it is nothing special until we do it in remembrance of him and when we do it in remembrance of him we remember his sacrifice we remember the fact that his body was broken it was beat it was bruised for us to be able to heal us his blood was shed so that we would have the ability to have forgiveness of sin that we could be one with God and that is what this is all about so as we take communion let's do it with the right heart do it with the fact of remembering Jesus not doing it just because we're in church not doing it because we feel we have to let's do it because we love Jesus and want to remember what it is that he did for us so start hearing feedback <clears throat> sorry sound guy thing all right so in verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 11 and it said and when he had given thanks he break it meaning the bread and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me so if you would raise your bread heavenly father we just thank you lord for this bread this symbolizes your broken body <clears throat> help us lord to remember what it is that you did for us father and that through you we do have healing through our faith in you though it's not in this symbol father we remember through this symbol that your body was broken and so we thank you and we praise you father that you were willing to do that for us so go with us, Lord, for it's in Jesus' name. Amen. And it goes on and says, After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink, if... Uh, as you drink it in remembrance of me so this is a symbol of the new covenant the fact that we don't have to do the annual sacrifices anymore we don't have to do any of that <clears throat> because the ultimate sacrifice was given through Jesus Christ and the symbol of his blood comes as our forgiveness so we do this in remembrance of the fact that we are saved through the blood of Jesus so Heavenly Father Lord we just thank you Lord for the shed blood the Father you willingly gave the Father you were so willing and you wanted a relationship with us so much that you sacrificed the ultimate thing and you shed that blood so that we might have forgiveness of sin so Father we just praise you Father for we're not worthy but Lord God you loved us so much you see us as worthy so go with us now lord help us lord to remember you and all you did first in jesus name we ask these things
Amen. So I encourage you guys, don't just have to do it at church. Every time, do it in remembrance of Jesus. And now I believe we have a special. So come on up. Good morning, guys.
that you bore and the debt that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is Thank you, Sarah. He is so good. The reason I sing. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Was well, God good or what? Amen. Yes. I want all of our kids to stand. We're going to pray for them and dismiss them to their classes. I want to refer back to this because I got some good advice from our pastor of helps, assistant pastor, to not do what I was thinking of. But I want to know... <laughs> How many of you have cousins at church today? Kids. How many of you have a cousin that goes to church here? One, two, three, four, five, all them, six. Six of you, seven. Okay. Eight. All right. I'll come back to that. All right. Let's pray. We're going to dismiss the kids. Thank you, Lord, for our children and for the blessing that they are in this place. We are so grateful that we have many children. And we want to continue to always have many children. Because oh, that's what the, the first command of the Bible was to be fruitful and multiply. And Lord, if it was important then, it's still important now. So I pray you'll be with our kids. Give them a great common class. Be with Pastor Kevin as he teaches them today and all those that are involved. We just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you give our kids a big hand as they go to their class? Um, as they go, we just mention a couple things real quick uh, that have already been mentioned today. But um, we do have five, or four or five um, high school seniors graduating this year. And four of them are graduating from Chilhowee High School. And Leslie gave me an invitation to share with all of you for rain. But there's actually, I think, four um, from our church that are graduating from Chilhowee High. And that is on the 19th of May. At 6 o'clock in the evening is the Choi Alley High School graduation. So it'll be Rain, uh, Haley, Cora, and um, Cole. Yeah, are all graduating. So that'd be fun for us to just go and cheer them on, wouldn't it? Uh, on that night. And maybe give them a little gift, too. That's always good. Uh, also, uh, as I already mentioned, too, the security team. Uh, if you... If you like to carry, if, uh, um, if you have a concealed weapon permit, we encourage that for law-abiding citizens. I actually have my concealed weapon permit. I'm not carrying today, but I do have my permit, so I can. Um, and we need the law-abiding citizens to do that. If you do have your permit and you would like to be part of the security team, um, please see Elaine. And um, it's legal to carry concealed weapon at church in the state of Virginia, but you have to have the permission of the pastor. Yep. So you can't just show up and just, just do it. You have to, you have to, the pastor has to give you approval for that. And, and so part of our security team is if you're carrying, we want to know. We want to know that we're good with that. Um, and we want you to be part of the team so that we have an organized response should there be one needed. So, um, so if you would like to be part of that, please let Elaine know. Amen? We don't expect to ever need it, but we want to be ready just in case and protect our, our people and protect our children. Also, one last thing I'll mention, uh, this hasn't been mentioned already. Uh, some of you may be aware, um, Wanda's daughter, Jennifer Watson, did pass away on Friday morning this week. We're very saddened by that. Um, and uh, just pray for the family. 
The service will be a week from Monday. It'll be in the evening at Frost Funeral Home, and there'll be information we'll be sending out about that. But um, I think there was uh, a meal chain train that was set up, so uh, if you can help with that. They, they'll probably tell you they don't need it, um, but um, we just want to reach out and show love in any way we can. So please do that, um, and we'll get you more details in the service as well. Amen. All right, so um, today is part number five in the Limping with God series, which is why I've got the handicap sign up there in front. Glad we've got some outside now, too, uh, for those that might need it. If you will turn in your Bible to Genesis 29, and we'll start reading in verse 1 here in just a moment. As you know, I was out uh, on sabbatical January and February, so I've had to play catch-up on the preaching. And this is my eighth Sunday that I have preached this year. Uh, Pastor Kevin has preached eight Sundays, so now we're tied as of this week. So, um, and, and you know, not that we're trying to race or compete, but you know. Um, but uh, So I do feel better that I've sort of caught up. Um, the next couple of Sundays, I'll actually, some others are going to preach, so I'm going to take a little pause from that, but I will enjoy hearing them and the Word of God God's put in them. This series of Jacob will continue uh, throughout the year. I love preaching through, just verse by verse, through either a book or through a character study like this in the life of Jacob. It forces you to preach stuff that you would probably just leave out. And I thought a lot about over the years, why is it that people have been saved for you know, 20, 30 years that have read the Bible, studied the Bible, know the, the doctrines and the basic things we believe? Why do they need to be at church? And um, part of it is to serve. Amen. And we give out of what God has given to us. Part of it is fellowship and family. That's important. But I think also just the constant diet, the reminder of what you should already know is important as well. Because you know what? If you're not hearing it here, chances are you may not be hearing it anywhere else. Amen? You're not hearing it in, the, in, 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 our, in, our, in, our, in our movies, in our TV shows. You're not hearing it in our news. You're not hearing it in the conversations very often at work. You're not hearing it in so many places. So continually hearing the Word of God. So this morning, you may just be reminded again of things you should already know. But that reminder is important. Amen? It keeps us walking in a way that pleases God. So, uh, sermon today is called Kissing Cousins. Kissing Cousins. Now, here was my, I was just a joke, and I wasn't going to actually do it, but I was going to bring the cousins up this morning and ask them to kiss each other before they went to class. And, um, and I was going to say, no, I was just kidding, don't do that. But Kevin said, no. <laughs> he said, because some of them will do it, and then it'll be really creepy. <laughs> So we had eight that are cousins here today that um, did not kiss. But we're going to read about one or a few that did this morning. So in Genesis 29, yeah, they kiss on the cheek. But yeah, a, a lick lock, lock would be really creepy. You know, I know that my kids love your kids, but you know. <laughs> Genesis 29, and, and that, actually I don't have any other prop today, so just have that visual in your mind. That's the prop for today. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Starting at verse 1. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and he saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there. And they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haram. Then he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, Oh yeah, we know him. So he said to them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, Look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together. And they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Now while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And when it came to pass when Rachel saw sorry, sorry, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, 
that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And if you wondered, yes, that phrase Laban, his mother's brother is three times in that verse. Um, and we'll come back to that as well. Lord, just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this life of Jacob that I uh, has so spoken to me. And I pray it has spoken to others as well. And I pray, oh God, that you'll just speak to us today really about the, the, the desire, oh God, to honor you in, even in our relationships. And to put you first. And Lord, if we've made mistakes and if we've done things wrong, chances are we have. We've lived and we've made mistakes and we've done things wrong. Lord, I pray, oh God, that you will give us that fresh determination to live in a way that honors you as we move forward. I pray, oh God, that you will speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm back to my three points this morning. The well, the kiss, and the labor of love are my three points today. The well, the kiss, and the labor of love. So we ended up chapter 28 with, the, with Bethel. And the encounter that, that, uh, that Jacob had that is probably more, maybe more powerful, or at least as powerful as any other encounter with God in the Old Testament. But when the ladder appears and the angels going up and down to the heaven of to God, we talked about how Jesus described himself as that ladder. And so Bethel was 50 miles from where Jacob left. He still had another 450 miles to go. And it says in verse 1 that Jacob went on his journey. That can actually be translated, lifted up his feet and came to the land of the people of Esau, of the east. So the next 450 miles, he walked a lot lighter than he did the first 50. If you remember, he had left his home, he'd left Isaac, he'd left his mother, and he was being sent 500 miles to marry someone that, was, that his father had blessed him to marry. But he didn't leave. Things were not happy when he left home. His, his brother wanted to kill him. And there was a lot of anger, a lot of animosity. That first 50 miles was hard. But after he encountered the presence of God, the next 450 were a lot easier for him. He picked up his feet. And there was joy. There was hope. There was a future in the rest of that journey for him. He comes in verse 2 to a well. And it's interesting he came to a well. Some of you know the story of, 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 of Jacob's father, Isaac. And Jacob's father, Isaac, his wife, Rebecca, also encountered someone at a well. In fact, I want you to look at that real quick in Genesis chapter 24, starting in verse uh, 10. 24 verse 10. It says then, this is, this is, this is now it, Jacob's father, Isaac, his father, Abraham, had sent his servant to go get a wife for Isaac. So verse 10 of Genesis 24. Then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed, for all his master's good were in his hand. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. This is the same area that Jacob is going back to for his future wife. Verse 11. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. I don't know what time men go out to draw water, but the time when women went out to draw water. Verse 12. Then he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please show me success this day and show me kindness to my master Abraham. Behold here, I stand by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And as it happened before you had finished speaking, that behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. And you know the rest of the story, it ended up with, with uh, the agreement was made that Rebecca would travel back, would become the wife to Isaac, and the rest was history. So, but it's interesting to me that Isaac, his future wife was met at a well, and here Jacob, when he gets to the land, the first thing he sees is a well. Difference, a little bit difference here. I, 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 the, the servant of Abraham had 10 camels with all kinds of goodies. And Bible even talks about jewelry that was given to Rebekah when she agreed to come back as the wife of Isaac. Jacob was sent with nothing. He had nothing but the shirt on his back, maybe a knapsack with a few snacks. That's all he had. He had nothing, but he did encounter this well. And when he came to this well, he was, you can tell, he was happy. 
as the story progresses. He realized he got there. He made it. Verse 4 tells us, he says, where are you from? He says, we're from Haran. So, oh, yes, where I'm going. For a 500 mile journey by foot, you could easily get off path, right? So he found the right place. He says, do you know Laban? Yes, okay, I'm in the right place with the right person. Is he well? Yes, he's well. And then it can, talks about his daughter Rachel is keeping the sheep. That would have given him a clue that the daughter was still unmarried because she was out she, taking care of the sheep. So he had hope. God had kept his word. He had got him safely where he needed to be and here he is at this well probably not the same well but a well near to the one where his mother had agreed to become his father's wife and it's interesting here just it's almost like a little side note but it talks about you can see a little bit of the personality of Jacob in here verse 7 it says Look, it is high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go find them. And they said, but we cannot gather until all the flocks have gathered together. So in other words, he's saying you're lazy. Why are you sitting around in the middle of the day? It is it not time for the cattle to be done and bed down for the night? He says, give them water and send them back out to graze. No, no. We, we got here ahead of everybody else so we could take a break while they get here. And well, when everybody gets here, then we'll all together lift this heavy stone off the well, and then we'll get the job done. This is kind of this, this whole thing of, you know, just people that like to punch the, punch the clock. They don't really want to be responsible for it. They're not really, we're not, we're not there to really, you know, give it all we got. We're just here to do the minimum, <laughs> you know. We're just here just, just to kind of get by, and we're happy with that, and it feels pretty good out here. We're just going to relax. The others haven't got here. You, you know, you never work with people like that, have you? <laughs> just want to get by. Let me just do what I got to do, and then we'll be all right. And Jacob's irritated by that. Jacob was a worker. Jacob was the one that understood cattle. He understood livestock, and he understood laziness. And then when he's still speaking with them, Rachel appears in verse 10. He jumps up, and the Bible says he moves this stone off the well. Now the commentators are, I read said that would have been an incredible feat of strength because these stones were really heavy. It usually took multiple people to move these stones. So I don't know if it was his frustration with the other shepherds or his seeking to impress Rachel. <laughs> Maybe both. He just jumped up and says, I'm going to move this stone. We're going to feed these, we're going to water these camels, or these cattle, whatever they are, right now. Bless God. <laughs> and he shoved that stone out of the way. We were talking the other day about, about, about what was it? Who's was, was the guy? Oh, my goodness. What's the wrestler? Just to rip his shirt. Uh, Hulk Hogan. Yeah. That was Jacob right there, you know? <laughs> you will water these cattle you lazy people <laughs> you ever feel that way at work sometimes people just laying around waiting for somebody else to do it and sometimes you just get mad just yell and say ah! <laughs> I'm going to do this thing particularly if there's a good looking woman around that needs to be impressed you know with your strength as you rip your shirt and show your muscles I don't know if that's all that was happening but it was an impressive thing. Three times, I already mentioned this in verse 10. He says, Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother. And again, the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother. And the end of that verse, water the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Why in the world is it three times is it necessary to say Laban, his mother's brother? You can almost see it's like this is something he had stuck in his head. He, we know he was about 77 years of age. Arranged marriages were normal back then. I can imagine it was something that was set in his mind. You are to marry Laban, the daughter of Laban, your mother's brother. That's who you're to marry. And so I can almost imagine that 450 miles when he's walking with a light step. He's thinking the whole way. Okay, I got to find the daughter of Laban, my mother's brother. I got to find the daughter of Laban, my mother's brother. It's almost like, you know, years ago when a girl would give me her phone number and I didn't have anything to write it on. You know, I didn't have a phone that I could text it to myself, all that stuff back then. You know, it was old. We, we were back in the dark ages. So I would have to take her number and just, just say it over and over and over and over in my mind until I had somewhere to write it down. Then I want to forget that phone number. That was important, you know? And so it was almost like that's what he was doing. I got to see the daughter of Laban, my mother's brother. 
And three times he says it. I got there. I've done this. This is the right person. I'm at the right place. Yes. All is well. The well. Nextly, secondly is the kiss. Starting verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel. And yes, she was his cousin. And lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and he was Rebekah's son. So he ran, she, she ran and told her father. But it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him. I think it was a kiss on the cheek, we're going to assume. And brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. It's interesting. There's very few kisses documented in the Bible. Now, Song of Solomon, if you want to read that, has lots of reference to kissing. Uh, it's a good one to read as a husband and wife together. Don't know about if you're not married. But, um, but aside from Song of Solomon, there's almost no other reference to a man kissing a woman. Now, we don't know if this was a lip lock, passionate kiss, if it was a kiss on the cheek, if it was just a greeting. We don't know exactly, no, but he knew that this was the woman that was destined for him. And so whatever, wherever the kiss was placed on her face, there was great significance in that kiss. I, I, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. It says in verse 11 that he kissed Rachel and he lifted up his voice and wept. It's almost like, you know, sometimes the emotion, you're holding on, you're waiting, and you're, you're just waiting, oh God, when are you going to do what you said you would do? And again, 77 years of age, not married, staying single, staying, as far as we know, pure in, in his walk. He waited all this time, had this huge journey. And he actually sees the object of what he had come for. Kissed her and he wept. Uh, uh, my mom and dad have told this story of when they were dating and uh, they were living in my grandfather's house. It was a big house that was an outreach to the, to the area. And um, my dad asked permission to kiss my mom. You know, it's like when you're living in the same house, you gotta kind of check all these boxes. And, and my granddad said yes so he ran straight away and kissed my mom and it was the first time my mom had ever been kissed in her entire life and the story was that she burst into tears and ran upstairs <laughs> now I remember my first kiss was cherished by the way this is her birthday today so everyone should tell her happy birthday she's not over the hill yet but she's really close I remember our first kiss. It was at the, at the door, door of my, the house that we're in now as we were well, just going home and I just grabbed her and kissed her. I still remember standing there. She didn't cry and I didn't cry. I didn't even know it was a good kiss, but I remember it. Um, you know, those moments stick out in your mind, but for, for Jacob, this was the, the fruition of what he'd been waiting for and the direction of his mother and his father. Again, the marriage had probably been arranged. They had both waited. Both of them had waited. Not just Jacob. Rachel had also waited. Don't know how old she was. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I would imagine she was not 20. She was older than that. They had both waited a long time. You know, it's so important that we wait for the person that God has for our lives. You know, those of here this morning that are not married or have never been married even, it's so important that you wait, that you wait for God's plan and purpose. It, it can take longer than what we think it should. Amen? And sometimes it's very human to get impatient. For Jacob, it took 77 years. Hopefully it won't take that long for you, but it could feel like 77 years sometimes when you're waiting. But waiting for the right person is so, so important. There's so much in the Word of God about marrying the right person. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 3, it says, Nor shall you make marriages with them, talking about other cultures, 
You shall not give your daughter to the son, nor take their daughter for your son. It was something echoed all through the Old Testament. Marry people that believe in God. So, so crucial. In 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 15, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What is, what, and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? You know, when I, when I was first, you know, I don't know, my late teens, early 20s, I had this long list of what I thought a woman needed to be for me to get married. And, you know, and it was, it was a lot of things. And, you know, as time went along, I began to realize that most of those things didn't matter. In fact, I ended up getting engaged. Some of you don't need that. I was engaged before to somebody else before a married church. I've only been married once, but I've been engaged twice. And um, the person I, I got engaged to really kind of fit all those things. But the only thing is, I found out I didn't really like her that much. <laughs> she qualified on paper, but she frustrated me and irritated me. And so I've came to a point. She's a good person, but it just drove me up the wall. That was all. And I came to the realization before um, Jared and I started dating, really I only needed about three things. I needed a woman that I thought was gorgeous, even if nobody else thought she was. She had to be gorgeous to me. I needed a woman that I enjoyed spending time with. And we had a good time together. I needed a woman that loved God with all of her heart. That's all I needed. And Cherish checked all those boxes and some more. And I was so grateful. You know, 20 years we'll be married in about two weeks. And yeah, I'm so grateful. I, I waited a while. And, you know, I, I can't say that I, I didn't have a relationship. I did. I had girlfriends. I had another engagement. But I was 29 when I got married. And so that was old in a lot of cases. But I am so grateful. I'm so grateful that God brought Cherish to me. Waiting for the right person, taking time, not being in a hurry, doing it right, doing it God's way is so important because once you're married, that's the rest of your life. The rest of your life. You get married at 30, you live to 80. That's 50 years. That's a lot longer than you've lived already if you're 30. Take time. Don't rush it. Let God lead you to the right person. Back in this time of Jacob, it was an arranged marriage. You didn't have much choice. But you know what? There's something... I know we don't do arranged marriages today. But there's something so important about having the blessing of your parents. Having the blessing of those that you respect and that you look to. If they don't approve, if they're not happy, if they're uncomfortable, then I wouldn't do it. Unless your parents are whacked out and crazy. <laughs> And if they're responsible human beings that you know love you, listen. Because your emotions are all crazy. And they may be seeing things clearly. Listen. Amen. Is this good stuff? Some of you are already married. You're thinking, I should have been told this a few years ago. It's important. The well, the kiss. Lastly, the labor of love. Starting in verse 15 of Genesis 29. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relatives, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Therefore, what should your wages be? It's interesting. He already wants to make him an employee, not a, not a relative. In verse 16, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel. So he said to her, so, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years. That's a long time for Rachel. He's already 77. Seven more years. And they seemed only a few days to him because of the love that he had for her. It's one of those romantic verses in the Bible. Verse 20 of Genesis chapter 29. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed only a few days to him because of the love that he had 
for her. Remember, Jacob came with nothing. He didn't have a bride price. He didn't have anything that he could give like the servant of his father Isaac had had. He had to give something. He gave his time. He gave his expertise to serve who would become his father-in-law. You know, in our modern day, probably the closest thing to a bride price is the engagement ring. And I looked it up. You're supposed to spend between two to four months of your salary on an engagement ring. That's what you're supposed to spend is what they say. That's what jewelers say anyway because they want your money, right? But that's a form of a bride price. It's giving something to this woman that you want to give your life to. This is, this is a great value. This is how I feel about you. And if something happens between us, you get to keep that um, because this is what I'm, you're meaning to me. So he didn't have even two to four months wages, so he had to give seven years. Seven years. He said the time only seemed only a few days because of the love he had for her. The longest engagement in biblical record right here. Seven years. Now, honestly, I'm not in favor of long engagements. Cherish and I were engaged for ten months. I knew that I wanted to marry her when she said she wanted to go on a date with me. I would have married her in three months. We had to wait a little bit. I'm not in favor of long engagements. When you know, you know. But if you don't know, don't be in a hurry. Take your time. If this is God's plan for you, time will go by quickly. And then you'll know you have the right person for the rest of your life. Picking up in verse 21, this is where this goes a little sideways. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go in to her. That's about as graphic as you can get in biblical language. I have waited seven years for this woman. I want to go to bed with her now. <laughs> Give her to me. He said, as time flew by, but I am wanting this woman. Verse 22, then Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. They had a big dinner. Verse 23, it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. Wait a minute. It's supposed to be Rachel, right? He brought Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. And it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. <laughs> no. And he said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? interesting didn't he deceive his own dad and now he's the one being deceived verse 26 and Laban said it must not be done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn fulfill her week and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years another seven years and I'll give you the woman you served seven years for I think that Jacob was pretty good at what he was doing as far as the taking care of the cattle and all the sheep. I think he was pretty good. And Laban had a good deal with his free labor. And he was milking it for all it was worth. Then verse 28. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also. And Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as a maid. These maids will come into play in the next chapter. Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. Wow. You got to love somebody to do that, don't you? Fourteen years. He did not draw a paycheck. He just worked for free because of the love that he had. Rachel but how in the world do you spend your wedding night with the wrong woman and not know it until the next morning you know how that how that happens too much touching and not enough talking <laughs> that's how that happens Seven years he had waited. He was a woman that walked into his tent. All right, it's on. <laughs> Didn't even ask her name. He just, next morning, wow. 
Wow. Too much touch. Not enough talking. This is why it's important when you're preparing for marriage, when you're dating, when you're considering this person. Spend more time talking than touching. You'll get to know who you're with a whole lot better. Amen? Than just enjoying that physical contact. It's interesting here that Jacob reaped what he sowed. He had deceived. I mean, he had misrepresented himself as, as, as Esau to get the father's blessing. And here he was deceived himself. You do reap what you sow. I, I couldn't really find this in a commentary, so I don't know if this is right. But I suspect that Leah was meant for Esau. And Rachel was meant for Jacob all along in the way that marriages were arranged back then. Remember, Esau married people that his parents didn't approve of. I think there's a good chance that Esau was meant for Leah. She was supposed to get married first to Esau. And because Esau didn't do what he was supposed to do, Jacob ends up with both. Both of them had waited. Both of them had kept themselves. Both of them were unmarried, waiting for the arranged marriage that took 77 years to come. And so Jacob, within a week of after seven days, becomes a polygamist. He's got two wives. And on top of them, they're both sisters, and they're both his cousins. <laughs> How messed up is that? I mean, come on. That is messed up. In fact, Le Leviticus 18, verse 18, 500 years later in the Jewish law was says this, Nor shall you take a woman as rival to her sister to cover her nakedness while the other is alive. I just wonder if, if that wasn't put in place thinking of what Jacob did. <laughs> Don't do this! One woman, one man, but definitely not sisters and your cousins. Just don't go that way. That's so how we look at that and we think that's crazy. How ridiculous is that? But then we look at our own lives. And we may not be polygamous in the sense that we've got two wives or six or whatever wives at home. But we can be polygamous in other ways. We've had more than one physical relationship. We become a polygamous in our actions. And we've, we've, if we are thinking, if we are dealing with imagery that we're focusing on and pornography and all these things, we become a polygamist in our mind. We can look at Jacob and say, that is seriously messed up. But if we've gone from physical relation to physical relationship or even in the mental uh, focus, if we go from one to another, we're just the same. We are just the same. Hopefully not with cousins. But in every other way, just the same. I wish I could say that the only the first, I wish I could say like my mom, the first time I kissed was when I kissed Cherish. I can't say that. I wish that I could. I hope my girls will be able to one day say that. Most of us can't say that. In the marriage counseling, premarital counseling I've done, almost everybody has been has slept together before they got married to the people that I have married. Almost everybody. This is something that is part of all of our struggle. We have all failed. We have almost all of us have fallen short in this one area. And so when we look at Jacob, we can say this is seriously screwed up in his life, and it is. But we can see the same thing in ourselves. And as I've looked at Jacob, I, I see him as a mirror to my own life. And I look at the mistakes and the things that I did and the, the people I didn't listen to. I didn't pay attention at times to the ones that loved me and saw things that I needed to do differently. I, I went my own way, did what I wanted to do. And, and I'm grateful that I've only been married once, but I, the relationships that I had did not honor God in the relationship that I had previously. And so I can look at Jacob and say, yes, he's guilty. That is crazy. But I'm guilty too. I'm just as guilty as him. I can say in the, my early 20s that I realized that I, I, I was struggling so much in the relationships that I had that I was not honoring God that I swore off of dating. And I went six and a half years in my 20s without a date. 
And I almost wondered if God had called me to be single for the rest of my life. And the main reason why I went that long is I didn't trust myself to date a woman and do it right. And in that six and a half years, what God did for me was clean me up. Clean me up. Clean my mind. Clean my actions. And I'm so glad that when Cherish and I got married, the first time we slept together was on our wedding night. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful I can tell my kids that. I wish I could say I did everything right before that. I can't say that. But I can say that that was done right. And it was God that helped me. God can clean you up. If you have messed up, if you've gone down the wrong path, whether you're not married or you are married, it no matter what's going on even right now, in your life, in your mind, and the things that you focus on, the, t the energy, the things that you look at. If, if you are in, in the wrong place even now, you will surrender yourself to God to honor Him and please Him. He can clean up your mind. Amen? He can set you up for success. Either in the marriage you currently have or the marriage one day that you will have. He can set you up for success in that. Amen? But you got to see it for what it is. You got to be serious about it. You got to be real about it. You got to be honest with God and say, "Thank God I'm not Jacob, married to the woman that has two two sisters that are cousins to me." But there's other areas that I know that I need to straighten out. God, I want to do that and honor you. And if you'll do that, God can take anything and cause the failures that you made turned in successes in your life. I want to finish with a story out of the New Testament. One that you know really well. In John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11. It says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commands us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. But those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, dropping those stones to the ground, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of you? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That doesn't say here that she repented, but Jesus knows the intents of our heart, right? And I believe he saw in her a desire to repent, to change, to not continue down the same path. He says, I don't condemn you. I see repentance in your heart. Go your way and sin no more. Don't continue to do what you've been doing. Recognize the sin that you found yourself in. Change. Do different. Go forward. You are not condemned. Amen? Praise God for that. Now here back in the story of Jacob, he didn't, he stayed married to both. And I don't know what we would do with that in today's situation, but the one thing he did, he took responsibility for both. He provided for all the children. There were many children to come. He provided for all of those. He took ownership of the situation he was in. And God blessed him. Even though it was a messed up deal. God blessed him. In our lives, if there's any areas that we know are messed up, if our heart is to honor him and to please him and to turn, God will bless you. Amen? That's his desire is not to condemn you, is to bless you. That last verse is interesting. I got to stop. Verse 30. Jason, Jacob went into Rachel. He loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another year. The phrase there, he loved Rachel more than Leah. Interesting, this, this mirror image. Esau was loved by his dad more than he was. And here he's loving Rachel more than Leah. It wasn't Leah's fault. 
that you loved Rachel more than Leah. And you'll see throughout the story what's interesting is Leah actually ended up being a better person than Rachel. Rachel was just prettier. But Leah was a better person. And one thing that redeemed itself at the end. In Genesis 49 verse 31, when Jacob is about to be buried and saying where he wants to be buried, he says, There they buried Abraham and his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah's wife. And there I buried Leah. The end of the story, Rachel dies before Leah. Jacob ends up being buried in the same burial plot with his family and with Leah. Somewhere along the line, and we'll see that as we go through this story, he began to appreciate Leah and value her. But to begin with, he didn't. He loved Rachel more than Leah. And you may be in a situation where you, don't, you know that you're not loved as much as somebody else. And that's hard. It's a tough place. And all that we can do is continue to honor God and live for God, to trust Him, and believe that if we do things in a way that please Him in time, God will cause things to come around. Sometimes we just got to be faithful. Amen? Sometimes we don't have the respect. Sometimes we don't have the honor that we know we should have. But if we would just be faithful to God, He will take care of us. Amen? Amen. Can we stand up together? I'm done. There's a lot that I've hit today. And again, hopefully all of this was just a reminder to you, things you already knew, but maybe things you needed to hear. Worship team, if you want to come, I want to pray. Get done here. Lord, I just thank you for your word today. I thank you, Lord, for this life of Jacob. I thank you that there's so much that we can learn. From looking at these characters in your word. And Lord, as I, I looked at this man Jacob, I, I see in me some things I did right, and I see some things I did wrong. But I see, oh Lord, that as you bless Jacob, even though he didn't do everything right, in fact, he made some crazy mistakes and got himself in some difficult situations. Yet because his heart was to honor you, you blessed him. Lord, I pray for each one of us this morning. I know that we have all failed. In this area of relationships, almost all of us have failed. In other areas too. I pray, oh God, that you will give us a desire, a renewed determination to honor you. Lord, if we're married, that we will be faithful to that woman that God has given to us, and faithful to that man that God has given to us. We won't look anywhere else but only to Him and only to her. Help us, oh God, to make up our mind to do that. Be faithful not just in our actions, but in our eyes and our thoughts, and our meditations. For those that are not married today, I pray, oh Lord, that you will help them to be patient. Help them, Lord God, to wait for the blessing of those that know and love them. When they receive that blessing, to then move forward when the time is right. Not to try to make things happen. Not to do Esau. Just go out and get what I want because I want it. But to allow those that look out for me. Allow time for that blessing to come upon that relationship. And Lord, whatever are the areas of our life, things that we're dealing with, things that we're struggling with, I don't know what people are dealing with today. I pray, oh God, that we will surrender to you. That our desire will be on to honor you. Live for you. And you will take even the mistakes we've made. You will look at us and say, I don't condemn you either. With my strength, go and sit down. And you'll give us the ability, oh God, to do what we cannot do on our own. say we may have been married 10 20 30 40 years but it felt like nothing because of the relationship you blessed us with thank you praise you jesus praise you
Jesus, give you honor. We worship you, God. We worship you, Jesus. The worship team leads us. If you just want to come to this altar and talk to the Lord for a minute, this altar is open. If you want to just talk to where you're at, it's fine too.
that just kind of stood out to me. And I know that everybody, God spoke to y'all in a different way this morning because you're not me. But as you sit back and you think over life and decisions you make and how things go good or bad, you know, it is so good knowing that God didn't condemn you. Do y'all realize how old he was, Jacob was, at the end of that second seven years? He was 91. 91 years old, waiting for what God's promised him. He made bad decisions. Life was a mess. It was still a mess. And it's going to get a little mess here as life goes on. But one thing, God didn't condemn him. And he doesn't condemn you. Lord, I just thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you are in charge. And you are God above all. Above everything that would try to come against us, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We glorify you. And we ask you, Lord, just to move in our hearts today, Lord, that we'll be able to go out and share to other people what you've spoke to us today. Lord, we thank you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all have an awesome Sunday. Bring somebody back with you next week. We love you.